How, how did Jacques Gershkovich, Gershkovich come to take over Mary Dodge's? Oops, I just heard your Someone's wife. Coming in. Pay no attention to anybody. Okay. Okay. So tell me, how did Jacques Gershkovich? Uh, managed to take over Mary Dodge's symphony. Tell me ah, about yes. what was going that, on. That's a very lovely kind of story. There's a little bit of fairy tale about it. And, uh, Hold on, yeah, she's just going up the stairs. Are we ready? Uh, she's just let her finish going up the oh, stairs. Oh, okay. She's just going up the stairs. We can pick up the audio. Okay. I think we're good now. Okay. Okay, that's a good I think she'll be quiet now. Um, she opened the door, too. In large class. Now I'm rolling. Sorry. Now he's rolling. Sorry. Okay. Now we're now we're ready. Sorry about that. Mary Vida. She had a large and lively class in Burns, and um, uh, when her husband got a job around the Portland area, they of course they all moved in. She started her class here, and um, before long, it just got too many for her to manage because she liked to have them play together, and she wasn't really trained as a conductor, and beyond a certain number, they won't come in to together, and they won't stop together, and they won't rise together or, or swell together if you don't know how to have them do that. And she was thinking about that, and Gershkovich just happened to come into Portland. Exactly how they chose Portland, I do not know. I don't know any that anybody knows. But she got wind of his presence, and she invited him over to hear it, the group, uh, with a view to his taking over. And he heard him and he said, he, without any uh, circumlocution, he said, I take. And so he started in and immediately uh, he set the standard for serious music, which he had been trained to, classical music. Nothing cheap, nothing frivolous, nothing jazzy, Nothing pop, that was before pop, um, but but essentially classical music, and um, like uh, Schubert unfinished symphony, one of the first things he did, and uh, he made do. He knew the music and he knew how it should go, and um, if he didn't have certain instruments, he would pass them off to another one to take its place. Or on a very rare occasion at the beginning, he would ask a parent who played that instrument to come in. But in general, it wasn't a case of, uh, what shall I say, it wasn't a case of, of aesthetic honor or anything of that kind. It was just seemed natural to him. If this is going to be a kid's group, it's going to be a kid's group. And they're going to play like kids, but well, as kids could play. So little by little, as the word got around, uh, more people came. They played to satisfaction and they gave a performance. I can't remember, you may know where, I think it's written down somewhere, where they gave their first performance. It could have been at Lincoln High School, Lincoln. which my son attended just down the hill here. So he really, he, he was introducing them perhaps to music that they hadn't heard before. I mean, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, most of them had never heard of that stuff. He, he saw to it, and Mary V. Dodge um, attracted enough supporters uh, in society and of some means to provide the money both for his salary and I assume for hers and to buy the music and to rent the hall. And little by little, after they gave their first concert, it was so astonishingly good and so just to be so astonishingly professional that uh, it got a lift. It lifted off the ground the idea of a junior symphony. Nowhere else had there been one. Just took hold here. And um, for him, it was a godsend, all while in the back of his mind, hoping that he would sometime audition for and get a professional orchestra to conduct. I'm going to pause tape here for just to help bring him on and he, how was he brought on? Yes. She invited, she asked him if he would come hear the group and he said he'd be glad to hear the group and he heard them playing, I don't know what, but they were uh, respectable enough. At the end of it, he just said the two words which he knew, I take. 
And so that started the relationship. Uh, I don't know the details of it. That's something, incidentally, that Ernestine Orendorf may be able to tell you about, who was, I think, on the spot at that time. And uh, he just went about his own way. He rehearsed. And the most important thing that he did was to establish sectional rehearsals. You have an orchestra consisting of lots of string players, violins, viola, cello, bass, and lots of wind players, flutes, oboe, clarinets, and so on, and brass players, whatever they are, trumpet, trombone, tuba, so on, and the percussion that we were talking about. And they're separable in rehearsal. You can, you can single them out. You can say, I'd like to hear just the percussion for the next 15 bars. I'd like to hear just the cellos. I'd like to hear the cellos and the second violins unheard of sort of thing. No one ever heard the cellos and the second violins play anything before. But because of his thorough training, he knew how to go about getting things done. And often the second violins, incidentally, although they're playing what might be thought of as a less important part, have more notes and are more difficult, uh, which is unfair. So. Uh, he established the working methods, and they got better, and then they finally gave a concert downtown, and it was reviewed in the press, and it was raved about, and um, it was essentially the first one in the United States. And uh, they started, the radio stations got interested, making broadcasts, and then they'd be nationwide radio broadcasts. So they were that good that the, the, the press picked up on it? And... Oh, yes, yes. They were, they were that good. It, it's as simple as that. You choose music that they can play, and it will sound that good if you give it enough time. Do you think he ever intimidated the players? Because he, he sounds like he expected a great deal from them from the very beginning. I mean, he said, you're going to play this, and... I, 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 not, not having been an adult at the time, I can't say what his expectations really were. Um, he, he, it may have all fallen apart in his lap. You know, he may have given them stuff that was too hard and it sounded like hell, and he would say, I'm, this is not for me. I'm a graduate of the St. Petersburg Conservatory. I don't need to do this. But he never came to that point. It always met his expectations. And the next harder piece, they learned it. And the next harder piece, they learned it. And they put the first, second, and third hard pieces, went downtown, hired a hall, did it, and the paper raved about it. That that did it. That did it. So little by little, he completely forgot about the notion of applying for a job with a professional orchestra. He did one or two little forays in that direction. One of them, he went to New York in the late 1920s, I think 28 or 29, went to New York and hired an orchestra um, which was not the New York Philharmonic. Uh, it was called something like the New York Symphony, but it was a professional group, and it got a very nice response. But uh, it, not being an established group, it didn't lead to anything. So he came back where he had something that he had established, and little by little it got more and more acclaim, more and more satisfaction, and then visiting people would come by. Misha Elman, famous virtuoso, would come by, invite him to the rehearsal, invite him home for dinner. Lucy Gershkovich was a wonderful cook. And she would prepare piroshki and pilmeni and borscht and whatever it was, you know. And uh, these famous musicians would pay attention and they would leave town raving about this kids orchestra in Portland, Oregon. Now, so there was no other kids orchestra anywhere? This was a no very novel idea. This was, how novel was this idea? It was novel, as far as I know. I don't know that there was any other kids orchestra as such. Music in the schools existed at that time. Um, with a great variety of standards. I remember when I was here as a young teenager, for example, Washington High 
had a very capable conductor and had a very good group. And a lot of the people that I got into the into the orchestra came from Washington High. But uh, others were just wretched. So um, a little by little, it developed in town as a result of that. But uh, the radio broadcasts are what got the fame. And this was when radio was up and coming. This was a new medium, too. So right. the two just hit at the right time to Exactly. Get. Um, so tell me again, how, uh, how famous did they become nationally, the Junior Symphony here? Did well, they became famous enough so that they were receiving letters from all parts of the United States. I mean, Boston, Florida, Southern California, Michigan, Texas, not to say Seattle. You know, so that was, and uh, they would rave about it. And you've seen some of the letters in there, too. And this so, was through the radio broadcast? They heard it through the radio? Or? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because the further the farthest they ever traveled was to Salem. Um, there's a picture in the book where they gathered on the, all gathered on the steps of the Central Library, uh, along with some parents and escorts going to take a bus trip down to Salem. And at the very right-hand edge stood my father, who went as an escort, as a crony of Jacques Gershkovich. They were very good friends. They loved each other. So Mary Dodge did set the stage for this. I mean, would you say what was her role? She did set the stage. She laid the foundation for the, to, to take off with Gershkovich. I wouldn't say she laid the foundation. She set the stage more. She had this group of kids, as I'm told. Ernestine will be able better to tell you. I thought 30 to 35 students. There they were, making a pretty merry din, you know. And um, uh, they loved being there with her, and she just f felt her own limitations. And it was very, very wise of her. Apparently she didn't have an ego that demanded that she be in charge all the time. On the contrary, she was apparently modest, modest enough to realize that the group had outgrown her capability to lead. And to uh, the honest thing to do would be to find someone who could. So she, uh, she got him, and I don't know how close they became, but you may, the others may be able to tell you I that. I don't think they became very close. Um, so how long was Jack Gershkovich, how long did he, how long was he at the helm? How long did he lead them? 29 and a half years. In his beginning of his 29th year, they were approaching the 30th anniversary of the orchestra. And I was at that time teaching at Columbia University. And a former concert master of the orchestra named Robert Mann had gone out and founded the Juilliard String Quartet, which had become by then internationally known. And so the board of directors very intelligently decided the thing to do to celebrate was to bring these two people who had gone out into the world to come back and help celebrate. So Bob Mann was invited to come and play, and he decided to play the Beethoven Concerto. And uh, he was teaching at the Juilliard. I was teaching at Columbia. We lived actually only several blocks apart from one another. And we rehearsed at our apartment, he and I, the concerto, the Beethoven concerto, which he was going to play. I stumbled through the piano part while he raved through the, the violin part. And then I came out. Oh, uh, I, we were both going to come out for the last three days. But then Gershkovich passed away. And the board of directors, scratching their heads and tearing their hair, asked me if I would come out and do the whole concert. So I went to my boss, Douglas Moore, the composer Douglas Moore, Ballad of Baby Doe, you know that piece? Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, at Columbia University, and I said, this is the situation, they really need me. Could I have six weeks leave? Sure. So I parceled out my teaching uh, responsibilities to five colleagues, all of whom were happy enough to do it. And uh, I came out and moved in into the home of an old friend from childhood days that had been friends of my parents.